that's enough from Don Taylor. I'm going to hand you over now to Paresh Parma of Degreed, taking us through how the workforce learns in 2022. And of course, it's all dominated by what's happening post-pandemic. Paresh, over to you. Thank you very much, Don. So without further ado, let's begin today's uh, webinar chat. So uh, those of you uh, that don't know me, I'm Parish Palmer um, and I'm from a company called Degreed. I previously held uh, a similar role in uh, a company called Panopto, who was, well, who are really looking at uh, education from a lecture capture perspective. And I want to focus more on the learning habits for enterprise uh, and mid-sized organizations around the world. So here am I with the ambition of obviously cultivating uh, a positive learning culture with the ability of becoming and contributing towards becoming a lifelong learner. So, um, Don, back over to you. <laughs> well, we're, we're asking this question, aren't we, Parash? We want to kick off by asking the audience to contribute. In that big box underneath the question there, yeah, let's take a moment. I'd love to know the answer. Parash would love to know the answer to this. How well developed is the learning culture in your organization? Of course, you can define that any way you want to, but I'm really looking forward, Parash, to getting the answer to this because, um, well, I, I, I'm not going to lead the audience. I have, I have ideas about this, and we use the term learning culture a lot, but I'd love to hear people's own thoughts about it. Marika points out that work results will always prevail. People will sacrifice their development for getting their work done. And maybe, Marika, as well as people sacrificing their own development, managers will tell people to put their emphasis on today's work than tomorrow's capability. <laughs> Dan Roddy uh, echoes William Gibson, and he says, the learning culture is here but it is not evenly distributed. Brilliantly put, Dan, could you describe that in a bit more detail, please? Uh, I'd love to know more about that. Well-developed, Peter says, but it's the wrong culture. Peter, you can't leave it like that. Please give us some more information. What, <laughs> what, what does the wrong culture look like? Um, Barish, this is really interesting, isn't it? Are these the sort of results really? that you're expecting, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, as we go deeper into this um, presentation, I think, people will start, you know, feeling warmer towards the ideas, probably start thinking about other fresh ideas that they can incorporate into their own business. So, yeah, these these results or the chat window is exactly what I was expecting. It's very interesting also that everyone, people are expecting, this is, uh, this is my feeling always, that, of course, there's always a learning culture. There's always a learning culture in an organisation, but it just might not be the one that you want. So Marika's point is, yeah, there's a learning culture, but unfortunately, it's one where, individuals and managers well managers in particular and work dominates it um and the victoria says it's there it's just not very self-led at the moment so in other words mm. people don't feel either enabled or supported in developing themselves um casina says look i'm just starting to think about it working for a startup that's good uh, and james points out that when in different places he works the learning cultures are different that's fascinating. And yeah, Keith echoes Dan's point about the learning culture being unevenly distributed. The learning culture differs between different teams. I, I can look, uh, I, I'm, I'm unwilling to, to stop people talking because there's some great thoughts coming through. But I also know that Paresh has got a very substantial slide deck. So um, I'm going to watch as the, as the comments come through. Sarah's chatting. A couple of other people are making their points here. And we'd love to see those. And I'm going to I'm going to shift the layout so we can get back to Parash presenting. Our learning culture is strong, brilliant, Andrea. And moving into Fantastic. a virtual hybrid self development style, excellent. That's good to know. Strong commitments to training, but different perceptions in different areas of the business. There's that point repeated again, Parash. It's it's yes, it's exactly. Unevenly distributed. The culture of necessary training, not necessarily desired learning. You know what? I think I think we could do a whole webinar just asking people for their thoughts about it. And Carolina says, everyone wants to learn. But if it comes to structuring the learning to support it, people feel constrained. Yeah, okay. So the, the desire is there. Yeah, so the individual desire is there, but is the support there from the rest of the organization? Sarah, once you've um, put your point in, there we go. Similar to Dan and Keith, different strength of learning culture across the team in a very large organization. Right. Plenty to work on there, Parash. 100%. I'm going to hand yes. it back to you. 
Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you for posing the big question. So, yeah, let's get into the action uh, today. So, um, I just want to set the scene here. So, we'll be talking about the challenge, uh, and this will be all familiar to you, but we're going to be looking at the emerging vision, the conditions of learning, how to create positive learning culture, and then really get into the specific, specific sorry, of the data that we've collected as part of the How the Workforce Learn study, and really share, uh, share some actionable outcomes to developing a positive learning culture where you are at today. And uh, yeah, as, as Don said, there is a chat function, so feel free to, to pose any questions. So it's worth noting the job and role of L&D is probably the hardest it's ever been. Uh, and I'm going to try and bring some stories to life. Uh, the message you are seeing is not necessarily a new one, but really poses a great opportunity. Um, so for example, when we're being asked to do this as L&D teams, this means organizations are putting their people at the center uh, of their business strategy. Just want to take a moment to talk about a case study um, and notably Verizon. So the story I'm going to be talking about is an example of, uh, you know, Verizon itself. So those of you who don't know who Verizon are, they're one of the biggest uh, global telecommunication companies in the world, uh, focusing on both business and consumer goods. Um, their amazing CLO, Lou Tedrick, uh, recently won CLO of the Year. Uh, and she's really been leading the charge of, the, of, of this, uh, let's say, charge of creating a positive learning culture. Uh, and funnily enough, they're using Degreed to create this learning culture today. So if you take back, uh, so if you, sorry, if you go back to the start of the pandemic, um, this was the challenge Verizon faced. Uh, there was, a, as you'd expect, a huge spike in demand for the equipment and services, for example, better Wi-Fi and new routers, and all of their customers had to work uh, from home. So their customer support team had a huge demand on helping their consumer uh, customers uh, adapt to that change. Uh, this for, for Verizon was a huge development challenge, uh, and I'm sure uh, all of you on the call can relate uh, what it was like during this period not so long ago. But what this really highlights is this new and anticipated demand for sudden, uh, sudden responses and changes to business uh, challenges. So why does this uh, matter exactly? Um, well, if we bring it back to the uh, L&D world, most learning and development teams today are typically set up with a plan and a budget also. And a lot of what informs that is what is known and what is anticipated and probably a lot less uh, consideration for what happens unexpectedly. What we're hearing from our customers is that the greed is helping with these sudden changes in the working environment and development changes so that it be more nimble and agile so they can anticipate change that little bit better. So when it comes back to Verizon, uh, Verizon were able to convert the most critical training during this tough period that they had uh, from new hiring uh, to new onboarding through to leadership curriculums to virtual and digital formats within 90 days. So great way to be agile and nimble, but maintaining that positive learning culture. So this is our big opportunity. Um, if you think about how it's an opportunity, everything you see on this slide right now, these all require people to learn and develop new skills. Uh, that's how organizations that we see can adapt to these opportunities and challenges we have talked about. Each one of these boxes on the screen are new or a haven, uh, taking a new shape in the next normal we've been working with now. Learning has a direct connection with all of them and they're all going to be high on the CEO's agenda. So having this kind of conversation ensures learning has a seat at the table when the decisions are being made around strategic imperatives uh, moving forward. So let's take a uh, quote from the CEO from Goldman Sachs. Um, and uh, all these expectations we have been talking about, this is most likely the entirety of your CEO's agenda, or at the very least, a large chunk of it. If there are other things you are seeing, please drop them into the chat. Um, these things all require people to think, behave, and act differently. And that's what matters uh, the most. And that's the whole point uh, of learning. As this quote says, uh, do it successfully. Doing it successfully requires learning at sale with speed where it will matter the most. And this is easier said than done. So to make this more engaging, uh, I've just added this poll in uh, to... To, to see and, and see the reactions of the actual uh, audience. So uh, it's quite a broad question, I know. Uh, 
<laughs> what you do see as the biggest obstacle to me is this new expectation, the ones I've already talked about and the ones you see uh, facing in the next 12 months. But I'm always interested to see the results. And uh, I know this is an old school way of breaking down the uh, question, but uh, we see technology as a great enabler. But let's not looking... let's not let's not persuade the audience in one direction or another. Exactly. We're just asking. We don't want to lead people fresh. But yeah, the question is: We know there's a lot of demand on LND at the moment, but these new expectations. What stops us? What stops us getting them done, achieving the goals, meeting that point? Well, you can see. Oh, I love I love a poll because you watch. It's a bit like election night. The bars come in <laughs> and they is. move up and down. Uh, Victoria says, all of the above, exclamation mark. And James says, it depends what the expectations are, which I, I guess is a fair point. And <laughs> so I suppose in any learning question, the answer is pretty much always it depends. Um, but it, I, the, the answers seem to have stabilized there. We've got a couple of people, Michael and Keith and Peter are typing. And Michael's saying a little bit of all of them. Yeah, we should have had a fifth one. But the trouble is, if you, if you have all of the above, then people always choose all of the above. So I guess exactly. we're trying to force we're trying to force an answer here. A lot of people... Oh, so I, I think a lot of people choosing our culture, possibly people switching from our people to our culture. So that... that, that and that's an interesting... Interesting to have both of those on there and having to make the choice between them and also between processes and technology. Ah, yes. Michael says, what comes first, culture or tech? He says the biggest challenge is the lack of understanding of the learning process from other key departments, e.g. corporate communications. Keith, that's, I'm going to just copy some of these thoughts because I think we might, if we have time at the end for questions, because we've got a lot to get through, we might come back to these because there's, there's a lot in this. Paresh, is this what you were expecting? You've asked other people this question before. Is that what typically happens? People say it's our culture? Absolutely. It, it's it's a combination of the two most uh, answered responses. So most definitely processes and culture uh, come first and second. Uh, typically the culture comes first, as, as noted here. Yeah. But yes, this is what we've seen uh, across other webinars and across other studies that we've done in the past. So spot on. Everyone. Very interesting. Very interesting. I mean, some people, yeah, okay, I'm not going to put my two pennies worth in. I'm going to put mute, put myself back on mute and uh, hand it back to you, Paresh. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you for everyone for contributing to the poll. So focusing on conditions, not just the content. So moving forward, uh, I want to develop this idea that I've been talking about that leads us into the idea of building a positive learning culture and the idea being we want to encourage L&D leaders and organizations of all kinds to start looking at conditions, not just content. So this is a really great opportunity for now to talk about the research we carried out for how the workforce learns. You can most certainly download more about our methodology in our report. I think Don's put the link into the uh, window there so you'll be able to download that report. And one thing that's worth mentioning is that we have been studying how the workforce learns for over five years now, and this is the third iteration uh, of our report. Uh, we spoke to around 2,500 people to study the learning culture in this report. We spoke to workers, managers and leaders, certainly just not L&D professionals or CLOs, but more of a broad number of employees across different organisations most notably the biggest organizations around the world. Uh, it was a global study. A good 30% was from North America and the rest comprised of Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Australia too. Uh, we believe uh, this is a good representation of the findings we will bring uh, to the forefront today. So moving on, the best LND teams provide training and create conditions. So. What we know today is that LND teams are both providing training and creating conditions for learning. Progressive organizations such as Unilever are looking to empower their people to develop these items on the right and accelerate the development opportunities where possible through upskilling. But it really comes down to both of these sides working together that are creating the best LND organizations that we partner with today and creating the best learning conditions as an outcome uh, of this work. So what is the value of a positive learning culture you say? So this is what I mean when I talk about businesses performing better. Uh, there are some of the examples that we have found in the research that we did that really showcase the true business value uh, for creating a positive learning culture. It's worth me calling out, we've defined positive learning cultures by asking the question of our survey respondents, how they uh, rate the learning culture where they work today 
And we've used a slight variation of an MPS score using a scale from zero to 10 to really ascertain whether or not people felt like they worked for a company that had a positive uh, learning culture versus a negative learning culture. And this is a way we have informed much of the research that you're going to be seeing on the screen today. Uh, and just to highlight a couple of things, business is growing faster. You know, pro promoters are 166% more likely to say their companies grew revenue faster than their com competitors when having a positive learning culture and departments adapted more rapidly. So you're going to be hearing me talking about agile and nimble uh, across this presentation today. So creating a positive learning culture. So how do you create a positive learning culture and how do we break down the research? So uh, I'm going to be talking about four overarching conditions that will help create a positive learning culture. So let's take a look at those conditions now uh, and those findings and give some recommendations uh, along the way. So you have something uh, as takeaways to, to talk back to your teams after this session. So if we talk about, oh, so if we look at like condition one in positive learning cultures, learning is guided by opportunities, not just by requests. Uh, simply when we look at how people in organizations, let me just move that into the next slide, sorry. Simply, when we look at how uh, people in organizations are setting learning or career goals, it makes a huge difference if you're working in an organization with a positive learning culture, particularly if the outlook of the organization has and uh, will uh, look at future opportunities and planning for those future opportunities in the future. Uh, the benefits uh, for a positive learning culture far outweigh those with a negative learning culture. As you can see, uh, the blue is where uh, the respondents worked for a positive learning culture with the, uh, let's say, peachy color being the ones that uh, work for a negative learning culture. Um, and those individuals that are working in negative working culture are far less inclined to think about their goals and where their career will take them. So uh, creating a positive learning culture and the outcomes from this first uh, takeaway. Uh, something that you can start doing as L&D leaders and professionals is, is that will make a big difference, which is not a single action, but many different actions is think about how you can guide your workers on focusing on specific skills for their current roles and for their future roles that they wish to do in your organization. Give them more focus on specific actions on what's required today and what's required in the future. Uh, managers can help provide guidance to help them identify which skills overlap for these roles also. And I'll talk a bit about, more about the manager's involvement later on in the presentation. Secondly, encourage people to document short and long-term goals. Again, an opportunity to break large tasks down and focus on individual tasks uh, and some of the more tactical work really helps and emphasizes skill-based development. Another one that I'd like to call out that's really important is the idea of encourage peer learning into your strategy. Uh, there is no question that interaction with peers as well as professional external uh, networks is absolutely crucial uh, when it comes to diversity of thought, when it comes to outside in thinking, uh, and this really helps uh, businesses stay more competitive. Lastly, invest in technology that makes uh, learning more meaningful. Uh, and that's something that's more really uh, important and powerful within the organization. Uh, also look at outcomes and insights, for example, and don't just look at uh, traditional methods of uh, those outcomes like completions or happy sheet. Start telling a different story of how learning or your learning strategy is impacting the skill development throughout your organization. For example, skill growth and different levels or validation of those skills. So skills are built at work every day, not just in training once in a while. So let's move on to the next slide. So learning is woven into work. So what we've found is that companies that have a positive learning culture exhibit the behavior that skills are built every day, not just in training once in a while. I think you're on the same level as me when I say we all aspire to do this and we're all trying to embed this type of action into our organization. So what does this really say or what does this really look like? Um, we, are, we are saying this is not just one type of learning that is more important than the other. We are saying it's a combination of all of these that have great merit and it's all about having these uh, learning, uh, let's say, um, well, learning attributes all woven together. Uh, to make learning as effective as possible. Um, you know, learning on your own is more of an open way of doing things. 
learning by doing is much more immediate or learning in the point of need. Learning with others, social networks helps to build other skills like collaboration and teamwork. And learning via instruction via subject matter experts is a great way for learning from the most skilled. For example, when you think about all of these learnings and weaving them into work, don't think of it as a separate intervention. So learning to, oh, sorry, learning 2.0, what does that look like? So um, when you start doing that, you start be able to think about learning 2.0. And here are some of the things that organizations with a positive learning culture are doing and creating for their workforce. And, you know, I'll read those out to you one by one. So continuous, purposeful learning, they're always aligned to the business strategy, they're responsible and have opportunities to do that. They're connected to career development within the organization. They're integrated into the flow of work, especially with learning as well. Highly experiential, and I'll go into that in the next few slides, and highly collaborative as well. So this is what we see as an outcome of what Learning 2.0 is kind of looking like these days. So let's look at the takeaways. Oh, sorry, went too far on that one. So, oh, I'm not sure why it's doing that. There you go, sorry, back on that slide. So some takeaways based on the second condition. So focus on optimizing the learning experience. Yes, people already have access to too much of the content they need. And in many cases, they do find what they're looking for, but they don't need more noise, but they need an experience behind that to really extract the value from those learning opportunities presented to them. Secondly, this is one of the favorites of mine, which is, you know, leverage flipped classrooms. You know, I used to speak about this in my Panopto days when using video as a way to, or as a mechanism to, to run flipped classrooms, but use those to support engagement and application, uh, make meetings more interactive, give participants an, app, an opportunity, sorry, to uh, apply their skills. And this also helps with building uh, retention internally as well. Finally, communicate skill development and celebrate it like this is a promotion uh, and align the, the skills to learning goals and build reward systems behind it. This is what we're seeing in the most uh, sophisticated organizations that do have a positive learning culture. It could be that you reward uh, your learners with you know, maybe an Amazon voucher or a voucher where they could develop new skills like probably learning golf or tennis or anything along those lines. Sorry, Don, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I think that also you, you can reward people with kudos. I mean, the, the problem with giving people a monetary a monetary uh, thing is that it, it, it they may say, well, I, you know, a, a £10 voucher is great, but actually I think my, my learning is worth a lot more than that. And it, so it's one way of doing it, but it's cheaper sometimes just to say, cheaper and and gives people a better feeling and more encouragement to just point people out and say uh, this week i want to give a big hand to aziz who who's really focused on developing himself in customer relations or whatever um it, my okay. management experience has always been that giving people that spotlight it really works for 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 not just showing that not just making the individual feel good but also showing the rest of the team that this is what's expected. So it has a double effect, if you like. And Carolina, Carolina says, we could frame the incentives with loss aversion in mind. Um, I, 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 if you could explain what you mean by that, I think I know what you mean, but if you could explain in more detail, that'd be great. I, lo I love Andrea saying, we celebrate unsung heroes and subject matter experts. Yeah, too often you've got diamonds in the rough, the people who don't get the spotlight. And it's a great moment to, to let them know that what they do is appreciated. And by the way, everybody, this is the behavior we're expecting. So um, love, love to see those, that, those real examples coming through. Sorry, Paresh, I'm, I'm jumping in, uh, uninvited into your presentation. No, no. But, this yeah, my own management fun. experience, that's, that's something which I, I feel quite strong, <laughs> strongly about. <laughs> no, look, I, I'm just loving seeing all the, the chat and the observations that are coming in. You know, I hope this is really resonating with the, the, the people that are on the, the chat. Well, it is. And James, James has raised a point, which I know you're about to come up and deal with, which is that actually you've got to get management involved and it means 100%. changing their point of view. So I know, I know that's where you're going to now. So let me just mute, put myself back on mute and just well, what, I'll watch the chat develop. And please do keep the thoughts coming and I'll, I'll put them to Parish in a second. 100%. Many thanks, Don. And many thanks for the contribution so far. Um, so let's move on into condition three. So, 
you know, I, I hope this is all resonating and I, and I can see that it is through the, the chat window today. Uh, and I think everyone believes that it's really everybody's job and that is, it is really a partnership that uh, L&D is, you know, should be cultivated by everyone in the organization, right? And what we are seeing is that organizations that are embracing this idea are, are again being uh, brought into the and shifting into that uh, positive space of having a positive uh, learning uh, culture, but equally enjoying more sec success because of that. So the next uh, slide really illustrates this really well. So if we look at uh, where managers get more active, connecting people to opportunities, this is what I was referring to in my previous slide. And what this is really showing is that businesses that are getting their managers more involved in connecting their direct reports to experiential learning opportunities. And if you don't really know what those are, those are specifically ones where you can uh, practice the skill. So if you think about um, content itself, content is the theory behind uh, learning that skill. So if, you, if you've ever taken a, a driving lesson before, uh, that's the that's the experiential, that's the uh, practicing of that skill. And probably the theory test is what that content is that you are developing to try and pass the theory test in previous uh, terms. But essentially, experiential learning opportunities are projects, stretch assignments, tasks, fellowship programs, anything where you can help build new skills or help build uh, uh, skills of your direct reports or to plan and build documents uh, that uh, help your direct reports aspire to goals and help them to develop new skills um, uh, with taking on some of the activities that we've put in the middle there, like performance reviews, feedback and coaching, conversations, and uh, regular check-ins. Check Parish, I, I, I don't know how much yes. more you're going into this, but for me, I, I, people who attend these regularly will get very tired of me saying this, but I always stress this, the, the vital role of managers in, in being the point of failure or success in any learning culture because it's managers who decide how people spend their time and actually this is i'm not claiming anything here that is original that was something that was raised much earlier on uh, when we talked about the learning culture so i think we, we all know that the question is well okay this is what happens when you've got a positive learning culture look at these great managers they're they're, they're helping people practice they're doing this they're doing that but how do you get to this position from where you are now with managers? And I'm not giving them a bad time, but they are stressed and maxed out trying to do their day job, meeting this week's, this quarter's targets. And now you're saying to them, well, okay, as well as that, what I want you to do is take that person from helping you achieve this week's target. And I want you to go and put them on something which is actually going to probably reduce their productivity in the short term, but enhance it in the long term. How do you get managers enthusiastic about that? Yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great question. So, businesses that have managers doing that, um, like uh, you know, having these regular feedback sessions, having those regular check ins, looking at performance reviews, looking at plans, those are the ones that have the greatest success and the greatest success in building that positive learning uh, culture. Uh, managers that don't tend to lean towards uh, um, a positive learning culture. I'm not saying that all managers are bad, yep. but sometimes what we see is managers that feel they have or have the lack of confidence to help provide that guidance. So uh, when speaking to all of you, the more you can be doing to support your managers, the more likely it is that you're creating the necessary steps of creating that positive learning culture. I, mean, I, would, I would also add that, sorry, I just want to, yeah, in please. conversations with people, I've about this, CLOs in particular, people, people trying to make this happen in large organizations in particular, say that it's vital that just as the manager's role is to say, well, thank you, Bob or Jane, for doing that learning this week and, and supporting them in it, the managers have to have that role of theirs, supporting people, explicitly built into their own targets. So the managers have to know that other people are looking at them and seeing, are they supporting learning in the workplace? Are, are they doing it? And they have to come back themselves with stories about it. So, um, you could do this either anecdotally, or I've seen some organizations do it quite um, explicitly in terms of wanting to see managers be responsible for people in their teams moving on within the organization. So in other words, managers get rewarded if people in their team get promoted. And there's a metric attached to that. 
I've spoken to some, I mean, I, I won't say who the person is, but I've spoken to people who are CLOs in large organizations doing this, and they say it takes time. But once the habit is established, it sticks. So it's tough, but it, and it's a big ask. But when you do do it, then you get these results. But I think the managers have to feel that it's not just something that's nice to have, but something that's positively expected from them. Yeah. Yeah, Hannah's put it very well. I try to remind myself a line manager is also an employee. They need support and guidance on how to support their teams as well. Very well put, Hannah. And CIPD put it well, according to Michael. No group can create a more immediate and positive impact on the employee experience than frontline managers. That's why I love going to the LSG work, uh, webinars. I always get great input, great thoughts. Smart bunch of people. Thank you. Paris, I'm going to put myself back on mute. Over to you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, and I just wanted to leave you with some statistics there. So like only 28% of organizations offer individual development plans for all employees. Another 40% offer them only to some employees as well. So the more you can be encouraging this with your managers, the more uh, you're going to be on those tracks to, to building and creating that positive learning culture for your workforce. So let's move on. So workers get more varied insights onto their strengths and needs. So it always comes back to the employee in certain respects in what's in it for me. And organizations with a positive learning culture encourage feedback and progress loops. So it comes down to this question, who, if anyone, assessed or rated your skills within the past year? Uh, people who are used to getting feedback from peers, colleagues and getting external credentials encourages a more complete skills profile. So. Uh, if you look at this, um, uh, yeah, varied insights from the, the strengths and needs comes from uh, most likely from the HR function, from external providers, from their peers, and then lastly from their managers. So this feedback is imperative to you know creating that positive uh, learning culture. So let's look at those takeaways, shall we? If I can move on, yeah. So creating a, a positive learning culture for condition three. So uh, you can read what's on the slides to provide consistent guidance on what and how to learn, uh, offer diverse and active development experiences, make an effective feedback and process, progress loops that we've discussed, create and promote opportunities to practice. So when you do this uh, and train your managers to create development plans with their teams, this helps them focus more than just formal reviews and promotions, but more on experiential learning opportunities, really, to help them practice and apply learning with skill development as that foundation uh, moving forward. So let's move on to condition four. Um, so the, the idea of the fourth condition is that everyone can take on new challenges, not just somebody. So a more scaled approach to upskilling your workforce, uh, not just your tap, uh, top talent. So promotions um, in our research isn't the really uh, the one way to progress. Uh, there's actually a lot of different ways when you think about it and, and it's really twofold. Uh, learning leaders can invest in transfers, promotions, changing roles vertically, but individuals themselves from a self-directed learning space can actually build new skills and with that build new experiences through those experiential opportunities we were talking about. Other aspects uh, include growing your social network. So social networks are, are massive, right? Uh, helping uh, become part of that social network, becoming uh, a leader in one of those projects or being part of that project helps uh, give uh, employees that ability to develop new skills and to grow and hopefully build and develop their reputation uh, uh, internally. All of this falls into the idea of progression and growth uh, at the same time. So the workforce has opportunities to practice as well as to progress. Um, I think the workforce has those opportunities. So when we ask the question, which of the following types of career growth have you experienced in the last three years, given growth can take on many different meanings, you can see there are a number of different ways this has been delivered. So let me uh, zoom into a couple of these highlighted in the blue boxes. Uh, these two things are happening ever more with businesses who uh, have or are working towards a positive learning culture. With the idea of adopting temporary assignments, working with coaches and mentors to improve those skills really makes a huge difference to the development of your people and not to mention help uh, keep uh, those employees at your organization in terms of retention and that in turn 
uh, helps with employee uh, satisfaction. So let me finish up on uh, creating a positive learning culture step four uh, and take you or give you those outcomes that you can bring into your organization uh, today. So let me just highlight those here. I think, oh, sorry, that went too far. So three actions you can take. Uh, number one, ensure your talent strategy offers and values internal growth opportunities. So I've been talking about experiential learning opportunities, but you can incorporate, um, you know, internal job opportunities today. But use skill data and skill profiles, like what's in it for me uh, from an employee perspective needed for your business. Uh, and then use that skill data to inform yourself of their activity and where you can actually position them if new projects arise for different aspects of your organizations to grow. Uh, provide visibility of and access to those learning opportunities like I've just spoken about. It can be challenging, but you can do this via an internal network or what other organizations are calling opportunity marketplaces. Uh, you can really help with these exponential uh, learning opportunities and match them to the skills, sorry, the phone just fell out, to those uh, opportunities uh, because people want to practice skills and help uh, really mitigate the biases from an HR perspective. Uh, lastly, sorry, I think I, I was on this slide, sorry. Uh, support your people uh, with their own careers. Uh, the more you can support people with their own careers, like we've just discussed uh, when we were talking about the managers, whilst not a new narrative, it's still an expectation for the workforce today that they're empowered and supported to do so. Promotions, like I've said before, is not the only way of growing their careers, but again, it's a very important way of doing things. So let's move on to here. So L&D teams get more visibility into people's skills and interests. So very much onto the uh, home straight now, as you would say, um, a positive learning culture is, a, is fantastic for the workforce and the business uh, as well. But if you look at this am amazing data on screen, which is a benefit of the work we've been talking about, uh, which of the following did you uh, did you update within the past year to reflect your learning skills or work experience? That is what we asked in this question in the study. And the numbers are really amazing to see. Uh, they're most likely to update their professional profiles, their internal systems, their online work portfolios, all of which helps you, uh, the people on this call, and all of us in LMD inform strategy, content investment decisions, resourcing, career pathing, employee experience programs, just to name a few, with this bringing an array of benefits to the L&D team, which in turn can really cultivate uh, a positive learning culture. Now, to, to really uh, end on the, the content today, uh, and this is very much the last side today, um, but a positive learning culture is really a fantastic way for the workforce and the business. But uh, uh, what we want to do is help you uh, sell this internally to your business uh, with the message being there are lots of business value here. Everyone benefits when the conditions for learning are uh, naturally better. Uh, and we found from the workforce benefits immensely if one, people progress more consistently, as you can see with feedback from companies with positive learning culture stands out that little bit more. Managers find their teams evolve more fluidly and there is a greater comfort for change across teams. Uh, CRO chose specifically find also that organizations are more adaptive, which is extremely important or critically important. Uh, pleasantly, we make friends with CIOs and CTOs where they find the engagement and the use of technology being invested in is almost increased uh, and they're very happy to see people uh, are using the systems that are in place a lot more and this all, all comes together you know building that positive uh, learning culture uh, lastly businesses that are growing more rapidly and their revenues are outperforming their competitors is something that we've seen through this report as well so all of this helps cultivate that uh, uh, positive learning culture and these are the benefits that you can sell internally uh, by doing this but uh, let's uh, move on to the final poll so uh, Don, do you want to take this away? Well, you're doing, be doing a very good job. I don't want to take anything away, but uh, very interested <laughs> to see people's response to this. Um, it's a big question again from Parrish. What's the biggest opportunity to improve your organization's learning and development? And, and here we're talking about, that will take a bit of time to, to read all the questions here. 
uh, sorry, read all the possible answers. Is it inspiring guidance? Is it more, is it a wider range, more diverse learning and development activities? Do people want insight into learning and skills or more transparent opportunities after some intervention to practice and to progress? This is, this one is a bit like a, yeah, it's like a, a horse race and we're not quite sure which, which one's going to come through and win. The bars are going up and down quite dramatically. And we'll leave that for the moment. Well, and it does take a bit of time to read and think about the question. Feel free to drop your thoughts into the chat in the middle as well if you want to. Meanwhile, I want to thank um, Keith and Jonathan and Hannah and uh, Christina um, and Michael for the thoughts that they've been dropping into the chat and, and uh, Carolina about the role of managers as well. That's certainly something that's resonated, particularly during the during the opening stages. And I think, Parish, we're going to come on to that when we look at the um, look at the final Q and A bit and discussion, because I think there's an awful lot there about how to get managers involved. Normally, on a poll, Parish, normally we get one clear winner, but it's almost as if it's going to be a tie across all of these. Makes it very difficult to draw out trends and thoughts about it. Uh, any particular anything particular jumping out at you? And have you asked? By the way, have you asked this question to other people? And when you did. Was there a clear winner? Yeah, it's, 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 it's again, very much similar to the last poll we conducted uh, earlier on in the presentation where, you know, there, where obviously culture and processes was, was the far outright winner here. But here, um, I've never seen it so, um, let's say, equal as such. Obviously, more diverse learning and development activities is the lowest here. But seeing the uh, challenges and the opportunities, let's say, for inspiring guidance, taking actual insights and making opportunities more transparent is what we're seeing across the board in terms of, you know, building that positive learning culture. So, um, yeah, it, it's pretty good, the, the results that we're seeing. So I do find it to be a little bit more consistent than others. Um, thank you for that. Um, great question. Some, some great questions coming through, which we'll ask in a minute. Viv points out there's a big opportunity around reducing content chaos. Just the, I know you, you alluded to this earlier, the fact that we, you don't necessarily need, I think the word used was noise. You don't need more noise. We just need people to find what's useful to them and to get on with it and, and applying it. Um, James 100%. points out that the, the, the poll answers he's saying are changed. They're dependent on one another. And, and yeah, that's always the case, James. And, and as we said earlier, if we had a box which there was all of the above, we'd probably check that. And I think <laughs> it, 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 we're always trying to force one answer rather than another. So it's a slightly artificial exercise, to be sure. Yeah, uh, I see James and Sarah both <laughs> both typing as well. Don't worry about the typing. Don't worry about the typing. We're, we're here for the message, not the medium. Sarah's um, putting something into the middle box, so we'll, we'll wait around for her point before we before we move on. Um, Sarah says, there are differing opportunities in various pockets across even the smallest part of the organization I'm in. And uh, that's, uh, <laughs> it's a really good point, Sarah, that the, we, there may be one big opportunity across the organization as a whole, but actually you're, it's a really good point that tactically speaking, and this actually comes to Michael's point that, I'll, that I'm going to question, I'm going to ask Paris in a minute. Tactically speaking, there will be things that can be done which are very different according to geography, manager, department, whatever, in the different parts of the organization. So it's a, it's a really interesting point. And now we've got more people typing. I don't, I don't want to cut off that discussion which is taking place in the middle. It looks very good. So I'm going to, we're going to stay on this slide for the minute. Um, but I'm going to ask, as we are getting towards the end, I'm going to ask um, a question, Parish, which is Michael, Michael's question here, which is... Please. Managers and staff are so time poor these days. And, you know, wherever I've gone in the world, this is always the question, right? People are time poor. How, if you've got one quick win, Parish, which will enable us to engage both managers and staff? Yeah, it's a quick, it's, uh, I don't know whether I have one quick thing. I think I've been talking about this for quite some time, in all honesty. But uh, I think it comes back to the points I was making. I think. Managers play a pivotal role in the uh, in the field today, where they are really exercising the the true culture of an organisation, and it's really up to them to create a way, whether that's using technology or whether they're using their experience to 
cultivate a culture which is, you know, being able to learn every day for one, mm. but secondly, helping to, well, helping their team really develop uh, existing skills for their role, but developing new skills uh, for, for where they want to take their career trajectory. Uh, really, without that, I think, you know, uh, it's a bit of a lost cause, really. But I think those two concepts of helping, providing guidance, helping nurture them, helping to identify what skills overlap, what skills can be uh, added or which skills can be focused on, is a, definitely a way forward to to get the organisation to, to cultivate that type of learning inside of the organisation. Uh, I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to pick up on that as well. Andrea, I just want to say thank you for your point about the podcast. I'm moving that over to the questions box because it, I'm moving to a different layout now. We'll lose it. But I want to bring that up in a second because it's a really good point about how organizational culture can restrict the initiative of the L&D department. Let's let's go to go to Q&A. Uh, on the left hand side there, you've got the in purple where you can download the report. There is a huge amount of content here, which is great. I'm just going to move on to our, our question slide there. Please yes, contact Paresh directly there uh, on, on his email address. And of course, that's my LinkedIn if you want to follow me as well. Uh, always happy to stay in touch with the community. Um, I want to just, we've got, there's, there's a lot of stuff to, to draw on here. And I'm going to pull out various bits, but I want to jump on that thing I was mentioning from Andrea and then go back to this point about induction and involving managers, which we had a great conversation about. Uh, Andrea said, look, we, no, sorry, I want to point, uh, before I come on to Andrea, the, the business about quick win with managers. I don't think there's a single quick win, Michael, which engages both managers and staff. You're right, they're both time poor. But if you want to get to the staff, and if the staff and the managers are both time poor, you have to win over the managers first. They will then make time for the staff. So for me, the quickest win, generically speaking, is to have the conversation with the managers about what performance problems they're having. What's keeping them up at night? What's making it difficult for them to meet their weekly, monthly, quarterly goals? And everyone manager's got them. Uh, not every manager, sorry, let me turn my camera on because I'm sort of talking uh, into the space here. Uh, not every manager will have something that's clear, but some managers will do. Not every problem will be solvable with skills or knowledge, but some will be. Being brutal, or if you like, clear about where you can help and where you can't is, I think, essential. So I think the, the short answer is have the conversation with the manager. Possibly you just have a lunch with people throughout the organization. Uh, and I would, I would try to have two contact points, maybe lunch is too much, maybe a cup of tea with two people each week just to find out what's going on. And enough time will develop. You develop the relationship to begin with, even if you don't do anything as a result. But one thing you do also is in, in some of these cases, you find places where learning development can make a difference in the short term. And when you've got that, you focus on it and you win that manager's heart. So I'm, I'm putting it rather dramatically. But what I'm saying is that you make a difference to their life. You make things easier for them. They then become somebody who gives tells a good story about you and the organization. And that then spreads. It doesn't happen immediately. But you win over those people one by one. When you start becoming developing a great reputation for yourself, the first one, you don't see any effect. But after five or six of these, people start coming to you realizing what you can do. So it's not a quick win, honestly, but I think it's the only way really to get people on your own side and change the organization. Sorry, that's me taking over your presentation, Parish. Let me ask you Andrea's uh, point. She says, we produced self-development podcasts that can be accessed easily at any hour of the day, but the company want tracking and proof of learning and are not happy to see this new style. Now that's a real example of an organization obsessed with the wrong metric, have people completed yeah. something, rather than focus on performance. Any tips, any thoughts about how you can persuade the rest of the organization that it's okay for people to go and learn stuff without it being tied to some notional metric of activity rather than outcome? Parish. Yeah, I think so. I think um, when I look across the, the, the experience that I've had with Degreed specifically and, and using this report as a foundation for that, um, one, you have to open it up from the, the senior management perspective uh, to allow all learning to contribute to your lifelong learning program. That's that's step number one. So just going to take an example from Allianz here. The CEO up went on stage and said, look, everyone has an hour to learn. 
and they can learn whatever they want to learn. And this out, out actually cultivated a positive learning culture by one, um, giving people the resources and the needs to learn something different, learn something new, not necessarily tied to their role, but what they found is while they were, let's say, learning about tennis or golf or something that particularly interested them, they saw learning towards their role also increase from the learning activity inside of their, uh, let's say, reporting suite as well. So that was step one. Step two, yeah, don't look at just completions. I think it just really gives uh, a really uh, finite view of what's happening. Look at different types of stories that you could tell around your learning. Talk about the engagement, how much engagement has been, been carried out, because that's one of the KPIs we see uh, every day across uh, organizations that we work with. Look at your content consumption. Look at your repository of what type of content has been completed, not just you know, courses, look at your articles, your book, where you're learning from the flow of work. All of these indicative views help, you know, tell that story of a different learning, a, a learning 2.0 that we were speaking about earlier. Thirdly, look at your skill story. What inventory do you have? What skills do you have in place today? What can you build? What can you buy? What can you borrow across the organization? And you want something uh, or a report or, or the, the, the actual data to actually tell you what that uh, uh, skill set or skill inventory looks like inside of your organization. So that's what we see as learning 2.0 and what we see as the, uh, the data set behind uh, all of that learning that's happening inside of those organizations that we're working with. Sorry, I was trying to keep track of, uh, of everything that's going on. Uh, you mentioned Allianz there and I've just dropped into the chat. They're, they're really powerful annual people report that they put out and i think that demonstrates their real commitment to people learning um uh, it, it, it's it, it's a it's a world away now the reason i dropped from from what well, most other organizations do and the reason why i dropped that in there is that i think it's very valuable to show to other people in the organization if you can point out the look uh, you know i'm not making this stuff up this is actually mm. something which um other organizations are doing and doing very well and we should probably be doing it too so i think that um and it's a 54 page report you know they're not it's not just a few quotes on, on the back of a pdf um james is saying is there still an accepted value of asking learners how they feel about their learning journey i, I mean my answer is yes there's always value in that it has to be backed up probably by some metrics as well. But Paris, what do you think? Is there value in asking people how they feel about their learning journey and the, and the learning culture? Is that a place we should start maybe? Yeah, 100%. Why not? This is going to help give you the data that you need to make things better. Without that feedback loop like we were discussing earlier, there is no way to improve and make things better. And that's what everyone wants to do. Make learning more accessible, right? Make learning yeah. more accessible, make skills more easily to be you built and practiced by the use of subject matter experts. And it really comes back to everyone is a part of LD. Everyone has that purpose to uh, build uh, new skills and create that framework so that, you know, new joiners, people that want to switch their careers can build those new skills and be free to uh, use learning as the backbone of that to, to get that skill growth where needed. We've got uh, just three minutes left. So I'm going to quickly. Um go to the point that was raised earlier about um onboarding and getting people getting managers in particular part yes. of the development process right from the start and jonathan said we're currently piloting adding an induction goal to both a new joiner and their manager so ownership of induction and settling in is a joint responsibility Setting the scene from the start that development is important and setting the goal from the start cements this. It also, I, I would guess, means that there's a strong expectation amongst new employees that it, that will continue in the organization. Parish, what's your view about that? Putting that emphasis on, man, on manager and, and new joiner that they are jointly responsible for development? Yeah, I, I think it's like everything, it's a joint relationship and partnership i see um and what we see across the, the study and, and, and my experiences as well uh, manager has most definitely has to provide some sort of guidance to the employee to help them start thinking about what they want to achieve and how they want to achieve it and like i was explaining in the in the presentation those learning goals and 
let's say, learning tasks and breaking those down into different tasks really helps the employee figure out the next route in their organization or how they could either move vertically or laterally across the organization. And it's then up to the manager from an onboarding perspective to then guide them, uh, give them confidence in uh, what they're doing today, but also give them, uh, let's say, little tidbits of where they should be looking to, what social network to leverage, what external uh, programs they may be wanting to look at. Because it really is a combination of all of those things, yep. outside in thinking, social networks, manager guidance, but ultimately it comes down to the employee as well to to drive yep. their own career development. And that's the that's one of the most important things. It's not just going to be given on a, let's say, a, a plate for the employee. I think it's a combination of all of those different things that help drive this. And momentum. that's why I like this idea of it being a joint responsibility. We've got we, we yeah. actually time up. I'm, I'm just going to give a shout out to Keith and I'm, I'm going to hand over to you for the for the last word, uh, Parish. Keith says, we used open badges to reward, record and incentivize learning. We later introduced manager endorsement to give an objective comment on the learner's work. And the learners themselves pursued managers to endorse. Really interesting. So the managers were being pursued by by employees saying, "Hey, look at what I've done. Can you can you give the thumbs up to that?" We got lots of positive feedback from managers who said they gained much more insight into staff learning than they had previously. So it may have been an, uh, an unintended consequence, but this mechanism of the badges meant that it was stimulating a conversation between employees and managers which I think is is fabulous. And James asked, did the open badges become a natural process? And he says it grew organically over time. In some places, it reached a critical mass quickly. In other places, it, it took time to take root. But it and it became the way, the way that people like to learn and develop. Really, really interesting point. So Keith, thank you for sharing that as a really good example of how it's possible to use a simple technique to not wave a magic technological wand over this, but as it always comes down to, stimulating valuable conversations between people, because that's always the driver where real change happens. Thank you so much. Um, Paris, I've, I've been talking quite enough. Apologies for me interrupting, but I feel very passionately about right. this topic. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to you to, to uh, wrap up, and, and I'll just point everyone to the resources on the left-hand side where you can download a host of useful stuff. Paris, how would you like to wrap up what you've been saying today? I just want to say, look, big thank you. Thank you, Don, for being an amazing host. Uh, thank you for everyone's comments. I think it's been a very lively and engaging uh, conversation today. So I applaud everyone for, you know, contributing, sharing your ideas, posting your questions. Yeah. We really do love that here today. Um, but if there's anything else that you may need, and, you know, an hour is not really, uh, you know, a, a long enough time to, to capture everything, but please, please post your questions to the email address that you see on screen today, parish at degree.com more than happy to, to help uh, answer more of your questions that you're you're facing and help you uh, get to where you need to be from a positive learning culture. But if there's anything else you need, just drop me a line, happy to help. Thank you, Parish. And I, I agree with, with James at the end there. An interesting subject that will never be finished, a bit like learning. Absolutely. Thank you very much, <laughs> everyone in the room, for all your contributions. Great to get all your thoughts coming there. Really made that a, a valuable conversation. And of course, thank you to the man who brought the data and stimulated the conversation, Parish Palmer of Degree. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again, I hope, in two weeks' time, if, you, if I don't see you first, at the Learning Technologies Autumn Forum next week in London. Bye for now. Thank you so much.